it's really a, a great honor and a big privilege to uh, welcome the Honorable Patrick Kennedy to our campus today and to welcome all of you uh, colleagues, friends, and students uh, to this special event. <coughs> We're here celebrating the official launching of neuroscience at URI. Uh, we call this a week of neuroscience at URI, and we're beginning with the conversations with Patrick Kennedy today, but on the 6th next week, we will have the official launch where President Dooley is going to introduce neuroscience program and officially open it uh, to begin for the spring. Why neuroscience and why are we talking about neuroscience at URI? I have to tell you that when I came here 12 years ago, there were already neuroscientists at URI. As a matter of fact, there have been neuroscientists at URI for 40 years or so. Some of our faculty are among the founding members of the Society for Neuroscience. When at that meeting in 1970, there were maybe about 400 you know, individuals who met to uh, have a conference on neuroscience. A few weeks ago, the Society for Neuroscience in Washington, D.C. had more, uh, more than 40,000 participants. So you can imagine in just a few decades going from 400 individuals to 40,000 participants. It shows you the great, you know, you know the um, importance and significance of neuroscience that has occurred over the decades. Neuroscience touches everything. And the interdisciplinary neuroscience program we have here at URI is truly interdisciplinary. Uh, there are five colleges that are participating in this program. Pharmacy, engineering, human science and service, uh, cells, um, uh, engineering, I, I've mentioned. I'm, I know I will miss arts and sciences. Of all. Dean, Dean Brownell will not let me forgive that. And by the way, she is co-sponsoring this event. At least five colleges and 15 departments. There are 30 to 40 individuals already here at URI who identify with neuroscience. So when we are introducing a new program, a new graduate program in interdisciplinary neuroscience at URI, we're not saying that neuroscience is new at URI. What we have done is really bring neuroscience and make it, you know, give it an official name and an umbrella and a forum for it to grow and to move forward. Why is this important? At least one in three Americans are affected, you know, with mental health. If you look at the outlook for our state in economic development for the future, most of the jobs are going to be in healthcare sector. And in addition to mental health, if we consider the aging population, thank you, no problem. <laughs> We call that successful aging in neuroscience, by the way. <laughs> and we would be very interested in individuals like that. I do not really want to take too much time, you know, because we have a short one hour, you know, uh, uh, discussion. But I just want you to understand that neuroscience is very big. It impacts every aspect of our lives, whether it's our health care, our, you know, um, uh, knowing who we are, our own intelligence depends on our understanding of neuroscience. It's very important for our economic development. It's very important for us as an institution. And it's the only thing that the only way we can get at it is having a multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary approach. And we're very proud to have launched this graduate program. And we're very honored to you know, have you know, uh, uh, Congressman Kennedy help us kick it off. So without going any further, I would like to introduce to the stage the president of URI, David Dooley. Thank you, Nasser. Uh, it's a special privilege for me today to be here to 
introduce formally one of the first individuals who welcomed Lynn and I to Rhode Island in June of 2009 when we arrived was, was Congressman Patrick Kennedy, who made it clear then that he was very, very interested in finding ways to build upon the strengths of the University of Rhode Island to advance the capabilities of the state and the quality of life of all Rhode Islanders. And I have to tell you, Congressman, that uh, although we were already committed to come to URI, uh, that once she met you, my wife made it clear that there was absolutely no thought, to be no thought of ever reversing that decision or going back to Montana because she said, I want to live in a state where Patrick Kennedy is my congressman. And I think what she saw and what I've seen and I think all of you have seen is, is that in Congressman Kennedy you have the very rare and I think troublingly for all of us as Americans increasingly rare conjunction of someone who is devoted to making a difference, a positive difference in the lives of people both pol as a politician but also someone who is a very deep and visionary thinker about how to accomplish that and how that is different than the usual kind of partisan political battles that I think is so troubling for all of us today. Congressman Kennedy has distinguished himself throughout his career as someone who could see what's coming next, as someone who could anticipate what the challenges of the future were going to be and how the United States needed to respond to those challenges. And he's done that extraordinarily well in all of the areas upon which neuroscience touches. He has established himself as a leader in having the country confront the implications both of traumatic brain injury as well as inherited neurological disorders about the necessity of providing equity in treatment and diagnosis to all of Americans to deal with those problems and the importance of fundamental as well as clinical research in building the capacity to deal with the mental health and neurological issues of the future. He has established himself as a visionary leader in those areas. He has devoted himself particularly now as a co-founder of One Mind for Research, of finding new solutions to problems which have bedeviled humanity since our origins. And that we're now, for the first time perhaps in our entire history as a species, in a position to actually proactively do something to address those problems that we've struggled with for so long. So it's a special personal privilege for me and a special privilege for me as the president of the University of Rhode Island as part of launching our new interdisciplinary program in neuroscience to welcome today Congressman Patrick Kennedy. We look forward so much to hearing what you have to say. Thank you, President Dooley, and uh, congratulations on your ascendancy to the presidency of URI, one of the truly fantastic state universities in all the 50 states. Let's hear it for URI! So I came on campus today, and I saw the signs, think big, we do. And so that, I think, would be an appropriate uh, uh, intro to my topic of discussion today, because it really requires us to think big. And I see former President Carruthers here, and I want to thank him for his many years of service as URI president. And I see uh, Bob Wagan. So he is... I know him as a colleague of mine in Congress. We served together. And uh, the benefit I had over Bob was that even though he was older than me, I was his senior in Congress. 
Um, and I, I just held that over him constantly to the point where he finally said, I have to give up. I've got to retire. <laughs> but seriously, um, we had a chance to visit out front. Uh, uh, we are so lucky to have had people like Congressman Wagan not only give to this state as lieutenant governor and make an enormous difference in our state, um, but I serve with him also in the state legislature, but that he continues his service through public education of the highest sort through URI. So, Bob, it's really great seeing you, and thank you for being here today. Now, <clears throat> you saw me uh, hug this, this great older gentleman, but he's young at heart. Frank DiPaolo was born in 1906. Yeah, and he still has that on his driver's license because he still drives. <laughs> when Teddy Roosevelt uh, was, you know, the, the San Juan Hill, Frank DiPaolo was born. You know, that's, that's uh, his span of life. And I was lucky to have Frank help me when I first ran for public office because he knew everybody in the neighborhood where I first ran for state representative. And Bob could tell you, as, as well as others, that all politics is local. And so ultimately, uh, the success of all of us who are, were fortunate enough to be in public life was based upon how well we got great grassroots support from people like Frank DiPaolo. Frank DiPaolo owned the largest diner in my district. So everybody came to him every morning for a cup of coffee and, and a sandwich. And, uh, and he traded that for me for their goodwill to help me in my campaign because when he said, I'm supporting Patrick Kennedy, that helped put me over the top. Because people think I got elected because of my last name being Kennedy. I can tell you I got elected because Frank DiPaolo in Mount Pleasant said that I was all right. And that's what made the difference. So I love you, Frank. You're my man. <clears throat> I want to thank everybody who's helped organize this. Uh, there's so many to acknowledge, but Lisa Wyan for all of your great work and putting this together. <clears throat> and, and Nasser, when you had that Rick Perry moment for a second, when you were like, and what was that other university that was supportive? <laughs> You, you, you reminded me of a recent presidential debate with one of our... <clears throat> uh, uh, anyway, I want to thank all of you for um, your interest in this subject. Um, I believe, uh, frankly, that the, the biggest opportunity for our state economically, because we're in a huge recession, our state suffered from job loss practically not only for more but longer practically than any other state in the country that we need to think strategically about not only creating jobs for tomorrow tomorrow but jobs for tomorrow as in a generation from now and moving forward between now and then is to how do we create enough jobs that can sustain our economy and I always in politics like things that I could get credit for numerous times so I like two furs and three furs. So the, the two fur and three fur in this is that if we got into neuroscience the way we've already been involved with it, but if we got to brand ourselves as a state to being a center of excellence in neuroscience, uh, we are going to be at the forefront of all of the most um, enhanced funding around the world, because we have to keep in mind that it's hard, I know it's hard for Rhode Island to think out of its own borders, but we got to think not only nationally how are we going to be part of this campaign, but internationally, because if we create a center of excellence that is multidisciplinary, as President Dooley said, then what we end up doing is putting Rhode Island on the map globally. Now, I know there's no money for anything out there anymore. Everything's getting cut. But there is a wave of demographic changes, meaning the world is getting older. 
not only our country, but Europe and China. And the challenges of this demographic boom is higher rates of dementia, among many other things. And the necessity for us to tra try to track a, a way to minimize, treat, or even cure dementia, Alzheimer's, is going to be the holy grail of medical research. And its economic impact is not only going to be felt in how we minimize the cost of taking care of people with Alzheimer's, but it's going to be about how do we, as Rhode Island, play a role in coming up with that cure and those therapies in a way that let, lets us be the beneficiary of all of those dollars that are going to go into this area of research. And I know everybody's cutting money, but at the end of the day, as Nasser pointed out so well, everybody's affected by a brain-based illness. Whether it's your child with autism, your grandparent with Alzheimer's, or your sister or brother with Parkinson's, or with depression, or with addiction, there's really, everything is interconnected to how we understand the brain. And even things like cardiovascular disease is impacted dramatically by your brain health. And even things like diabetes is impacted dramatically by behavioral health, which means you need to understand how the brain works. So you remember, well, some of you may not have remembered, but uh, Bob and I do, we, we were around when Bill Clinton was coming up with his standard message for the campaign. And he said, it's the economy, stupid. And I guess in this election, it's a, once again, as it always is, going to be the economy, stupid. But frankly, I'm here to tell you that I think it's going to be the brain, stupid. Because the economy rests on our understanding of the brain. You hear everybody talk in Washington now about how are we going to tackle entitlement spending. The costs of taking care of everybody who's growing old are going to sink our country and the world in a sea of red ink. We cannot afford to pay for everybody that's going to need care from Alzheimer's alone, let alone take care of everybody else who's suffering from a brain-based illness. So it's not about whether we would like to do this. We need to do this. It's about survival. And frankly, in order to be successful in this effort, we need to be smart. I know that sounds very simplistic, but political science is what neuroscience needs the most today. Because you can be studying developmental disabilities like autism, or uh, you can study dementia, or you can study uh, spinal cord injury, or you can study MS. You can study all of these things, but what you're really studying is the nervous system. You're really studying just the brain. It's the brain that unites everything. And yet the research in America that goes on today is really fueled by disease-centric approach. In Washington, I served on the NIH committee. There are 13 separate institutes at the NIH that study the brain. 13. Now, one of those 13 is named after my aunt Eunice Kennedy Shriver because my aunt Rosemary had a developmental disability. And you all know, because URI is the host of the URI State Games for Special Olympics, that Eunice Shriver started the Special Olympics. But in addition to starting the Special Olympics, she started what was known as the National Institute on Childhood and Human Development. In other words, she wanted to study birth defects 
because she wanted to study what it was that caused her sister to have a developmental disability and what it was that was going to help treat and better protect her sister. The point I'm making is she was personally invested in this. But it is ironic because what the NICHD, National Institutes for Childhood and Human Development, ultimately studied was Down syndrome. One of the principal effects of Down syndrome is dementia. Now, if any of you have family members with Alzheimer's, you know we've been making a lot of progress on Alzheimer's research. There's actually a National Institute on Aging that studies aging in the brain. But guess where all of the discoveries took place for Alzheimer's? Not in the Institute on Aging, but the Institute on Children. Isn't that a paradox? That to understand how to treat our grandparents, we needed to first understand how to treat our children. And it was the research that we did on Down syndrome at the Children's Institute that ultimately provided the foundational understanding of dementia that migrated over to the Institute on Aging. Here's my point. My point is that when you study any part of the brain, you're going to find things about other parts of the brain that you never knew you were going to find. And that for our, for our political process to organize research in such a narrow, siloed way limits the full applicability of that science and the, the benefit of that science because you don't have people looking at the science from a perspective as to how that science impacts other potential cures and treatments for other brain-based disorders. So another analogy. I got married, I moved to New Jersey because my wife's a public school teacher there and she's the only one in my family with a job. <laughs> so. Someone said to me there, who happens to have grandchildren in Rhode Island, they said to me, Patrick, how are you going to get the Autism Speaks group to join forces with the Alzheimer's Foundation and to join forces with the veterans for traumatic brain injury and to join forces with those addiction folks and those mental health folks? I said, that's a great question. I said, when you go visit your grandchildren in Rhode Island, do you take the interstate highway or do you take the back roads? And she said, well, of course, Congressman, I take the interstate because that gets me there faster. I said, hey, doesn't it make sense? The brain is our highway system of basic science. Our off-ramps for New Jersey, for Connecticut, for Rhode Island, are mere exits off the highway of basic science, the interstate of basic science. Now, if I want to get to addiction or depression, I'm going to travel down this highway just as much as I'm going to travel down this highway to get to the answer for autism just as much as I'm going to travel down this highway to get to the off-ramp of Alzheimer's. You see, we all need to be on that highway in order to get to where we want to go faster, even if for some of us the off-ramp exit may come sooner than later. The more we combine our efforts, the quicker we're going to get to where we ultimately want to go and the more effectively we're going to get there with the answers. Because it's all the brain stupid. It's all basic science that's going to create the big science that's going to map out where our exits are. 
So when my aunt Eunice started research, now named after her at the National Institutes for Childhood and Human Development, how could she have ever known that her husband, Sarge Shriver, my uncle, was going to die of Alzheimer's? How could she have ever known that her five children would all worry every day now whether they're going to get Alzheimer's? And how could she ever have known that by fighting for her sister Rosemary, she was going to be part of answering a scientific challenge that was going to help her five children and their children? That's the issue. We don't know where we're going until we all go there together and start to map out how all of our science informs each other's research. And now when you, when you and I think of science, we think of someone looking through a microscope, a laboratory, a cubicle. What we're trying to do with One Mind for Research is to take all those cubicles, to take all those dots and start to connect the dots. And how do you connect the dots? You take a 30,000 foot picture of something and you get to see it in more perspective. You get to see, as, an, as someone says, the forest from the trees. And if we can map out all the research in Parkinson's, guess what? We'll understand the dopamine receptors and that will help us understand how to treat addiction. When we research traumatic brain injury and its impact, we're going to find out how to treat other uh, impacts of neurological disorders that are precipitated by concussions. And what football players are facing is the same thing that hockey players are facing, is the same thing that soccer players are facing, is the same thing as Lou Gehrig faced when he took a number of fastballs to the head and ultimately got ALS you're going to see a whole series of disorders impacted when we start doing the basic science in a way that's going to yield results for everybody. But we need to get the money and the energy and the urgency behind this campaign. So as I spoke to Bob before coming in here, I said it's a new world after you leave Congress. Nobody returns your phone calls anymore. Okay? So I was trying to think of what I, in fact, I love this audience because I've been going through withdrawal. <laughs> and having a bunch of people listen to me is, is finally making my juices pump again. <laughs> I'm thinking, you know, maybe I ought to get back into this business of politics. But seriously, what we need is political science to inform neuroscience. We need to have a campaign. Now, as members of Congress, Bob and I would get lobbied all the time. So we'd have someone come up and say, this is my 10-point plan, this is what I need. And someone else would go, my, this is my 10-point plan. Well, at the end of the day, when Bob and I could figure out that enough people came to us with the same 10 points, we started to see the politics. Because we started to see, oh my God, there are a lot of people who think the same way and they're going to vote that way, and oh my God, we better be responsive. But when Autism Speaks go up to Capitol Hill, and Alzheimer's Foundation, and addiction, and depression, and then you've got the veterans who have traumatic brain injury and PTSD come up, everybody's got their own agenda. And you know how you make it really easy for a member of Congress to say no? Is you find someone who contradicts them. And if you find enough people disagreeing, then we say, hey, listen, this is too complicated. You know, I'm going to do something where everybody's in agreement, because that's safer for me politically. I want to make it safe politically for us to do neuroscience. But as you all know, one of the challenges of doing neuroscience is that it's often stigmatized, because people have all kinds of um, myths and prejudices 
towards illnesses of the brain because the way they manifest themselves is often behaviorally. And when someone acts strange, we call them crazy. We call them wacko. We call them nuts. We call them mental. It's pejorative. Who amongst us wants to be in that crowd? Nobody. So the challenge for us is to how do you get people to organize politically to be supportive of neuroscience when everybody doesn't want to raise their hand and say, yes, my family member had Alzheimer's. My family member had Down syndrome. My family member has ADHD, addiction, depression. You name it. It's a lot easier for people to come to Washington and say, today, oh, I had cancer than it is it was 30 years ago. But we need to make the same change politically if we want to see the resources follow our intentions in terms of fun neuroscience. So uh, I was you know, getting some briefings by uh, people that probably President Dooley and, and others probably set up for me from neuroscience community. And they kept telling me that the brain is the last medical frontier. I know that doesn't ring a bell for you, but I happened to go to a meeting right after one of these briefings to a meeting that I was on the board of the John F. Kennedy Performing Arts Center. This was about two years ago. And, and right after I had this meeting where these neuroscientists said the brain is the last medical frontier, I had the director of the Kennedy Center say, next year we're going to celebrate the new frontier. And I'm like, whoa, what's that got to do with anything? They said, well, as you know, like I'm supposed to know, because I was born after my uncle um, was president and killed. The, president Kennedy's whole uh, term in office and period in American history is called the new frontier. So I said, wow, and you know, a politician, my, the light went off in my head, wow, maybe I can get this new frontier thing connected and we can say that the new frontier for today is the last medical frontier. It's the brain. So I called up my cousin Caroline. I said, Caroline, you know January 20th? Yes, it, yeah, it's 50 years you know, since your father was sworn in as president. She said, yeah, I know, Patrick. Yeah, and I was thinking maybe we could get a bunch of neuroscientists together at the John F. Kennedy Library and celebrate this as the new frontier for today. She said, Patrick, thanks a lot, but, you know, we've already got a program organized. You know, we've got the President of the United States. We've got everybody involved. And I'm like, ugh. And then Caroline said to me this. She said, you know, if you want to use the library on the anniversary of President Kennedy's moonshot speech... I'm happy letting you use it. And I said, terrific, because we want to go to inner space, not outer space. And the neuroscientists today are our astronauts of today. And she said, great, go to it. So as I told you, no one would return my phone calls, because I'm a former member of Congress. But when I could invite them, to the John F. Kennedy Library for the anniversary of the moonshot speech when my uncle said, before the decade was out, we're going to put a man on the moon, return him safely. May 25, 1961. And then we ended up doing it in 1969. It represented one of the truly remarkable scientific achievements that we've ever known. And so I invited all these neuroscientists saying that the next frontier is today is brain science. And guess what? They all came. I got all the NIH directors of the Sub-Institute, TOTUS, Volkow, Insel, Landis. I got the principal NIH, uh, Francis Collins, he came. I got the head of the FDA come. I got, you know, I didn't get the president, but I got Vice President Biden because the president was over in Europe. They all wanted to be there because they loved that metaphor that's so powerful in the American imagination 
of us being able to achieve a goal that we set out to achieve. And so then I talked to a guy named Dan Golden, who was in charge of NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. And he said, uh, Patrick, I was around, I was a college student in 61, and when your uncle said that we'd go to the moon, I knew I was studying um, neuro, the rocket scientists back then. He said, nobody believed that we could do it within a decade. They said, that's too far-fetched. Yes, we'll be able to orbit the Earth. Yes, we'll get better, maybe, vehicles. But this notion of actually putting an astronaut on the moon, landing them there, and bringing them back, everybody thought that President Kennedy was really, really over his skis. But because he said that we were going to do it, we ended up doing it. And how did we do it? We did it because everybody was pulled together for a common cause. In other words, you needed to take the, the people that were in charge of the capsule and get them to talk to the people who were in charge of the rocket launch and the people who were in charge of gravity and the people that were in charge of all the inboard systems on the capsules. Everybody needed to work together. So I thought this would be a good metaphor, and it's turned out to be a terrific metaphor. Because the real thing that we discovered, among many others, when we went to outer space, is we had to build systems, computer systems. People talk about you know, where the internet came from. It, it was really propelled, in large measure, to the space race, because we needed to take large amounts of data and integrate that data with lots of other forms of data so as to know what we were doing. And we created the supercomputer. So what we discovered as a result of going to outer space, the supercomputer, is today what's going to allow us to go to inner space. Because the thing that makes today different than 10 years ago when we started the decade of the brain is that today we have the tools to go to inner space like we've never had before. So when we talk about this thing called neuroscience, we, we could always talk about it, we could make some discoveries, but we were really limited in the absolute amount of discovery that we could make because we didn't have the tools. So the other tools we have are the human genome which gives us all the genetic markers to tell us why some people get Alzheimer's and some people don't, why some children get autism and some don't, why some people get MS and some don't, or why some people get a, a depression or have problems with addiction and some people don't. So the genome is now with us. We can do the genome of the brain. Now we have other things, other tools, like imaging. So before we went to outer space, we had telescopes. We have telescopes now for the brain. FMRIs and PET scans. They're revolutionizing the way we look at the brain. You could never get through the skull to the brain before. Now you can. This imaging technology is fantastic. And we have supercomputers. We have things like IBM Watson, which is like challenging people on Jeopardy, right? We have to put them together and understand how do we connect the dots. Because at the end of the day, what's informed a lot of discovery in healthcare is what's known as an epidemiological-like approach, which is population-based information. Gives us more data that allows us to be able to better focus on where the targets of opportunity are. Well, with supercomputing, we can input the data on Parkinson's, with the data on Alzheimer's, with the data on addiction, with the data on traumatic brain injury. We can take data here and data there and let that supercomputer spit out some algorithms that will help us determine where the best opportunities of treating one of these disorders is. 
because the answer in one of these disorders may be found in science from some other part of the brain. And what's going to allow us to see all that science? A 30,000 foot approach, a computer model that's able to map out where all the patterns are and recognize where there's patterns. What will that allow all of us to do? It'll allow us to target where we're going to do the research. And so if you know where you're going, you get there a lot faster. I heard the phrase that, um, you know, the, the wife asked the husband who was um, driving and seemingly did not know where he was going, uh, do you know where you're going? He said, no, but I'm sure making good time. So we're spending a lot of money and going a lot of places in neuroscience. But if we don't know where we're going, we're not going to make the most of it. We're not going to be able to connect what we learn to something else that someone learned that helps validate what we learn and be able to paint the picture. So it's like a jigsaw puzzle. We need to put all the pieces in place. And that means we're going to have to get everybody to be part of this. So I talked to this guy named Chuck Schwab. Uh, there's actually a guy named Chuck Schwab. So I went in and I saw him. Hey, hi, Chuck. They told me that I better talk to you. Get that talk to Chuck? Okay. So I said, Chuck, you know, we're trying to do this thing, bring everybody together, get people to support us. And he said, Patrick, I love the idea. He said, are you going to have uh, some more Republicans there? Because he saw my you know, list of people, and he thought they looked kind of liberal and democratic. So he said, are you going to have some Republicans there? I said, Chuck, we're not partisan to anything other than the brain and how to get the cures. And last time I checked, you know, you can't tell a disorder is a Republican disorder or a Democratic disorder. Everybody, get these. Everybody gets these illnesses. And so we all have a national interest in this. So if you recall from your history books, and some of you I see in the audience actually were around in 1961, um, there was this thing called Sputnik. It's what led us to the race to the moon, because the Russians were really making great progress. They're Sputnik. They're, they launched Sputnik before we were able to get to space, so it challenged us. I said, I think the Sputnik that's going to get everybody to really get motivated is the fact that our American heroes, our, our veterans, the people after 9-11 who were like the people that ran into those burning buildings while the rest of us were running out of those buildings, the people who put their hands up to go over to Iraq and Afghanistan and other parts of the world to keep another 9-11 from happening on our soil. These extraordinary Americans are our heroes. And all of us as Americans owe them an enormous debt of gratitude. And the signature wound of the war in Afghanistan and Iraq is traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, if, if you want to organize a way of describing everything from Alzheimer's to autism, you can put it all under the banner of traumatic brain injury. Because understanding traumatic brain injury in all its manifestations is really the same as saying, I'm going to do research in Alzheimer's, I'm going to do research in autism. It's the same deal. Post-traumatic stress disorder, what's that? That includes depression, anxiety, addiction. So you put all of those disorders under PTSD, and you've pretty much covered the rest of brain-based illnesses. So you put TBI and PTSD together, you've got everything under the sun. So when I talk to people to get them to sign on to this, I usually have a couple of people with me. And one of them is a, a guy named Kit Parker. He's a Rhode Island National Guard. 
and he stands about six foot eight. Okay, yeah, it makes a huge impact. He did three tours of duty in Iraq, and he was a medic. So after the rocket-propelled grenade would hit the convoy, he would be in charge of going and dragging out of the Humvee all of his wounded. And he was the guy who was the first responder. But he said to me, you know, Patrick, he said whether one of my guys was hit and he died the day that he got hit from an RPG, or whether he died because of an IED, an improvised explosive device, that day, or whether five years later he comes down with a dreaded neurological disorder because of the concussion and the brain injury that he suffered that day. He said, and then he takes his own life because he can't stand and bear to live with the symptoms of trauma or traumatic brain injury. To me, he said, this is Kid Parker talking, that's a win for the terrorist. That's a casualty of war. He said, Congressman, we don't give them purple hearts, even though their brains are, brains are injured. Because when people can't see it on the outside, they don't believe it exists on the inside. And I said, Kit, that's the fight that anybody who's ever suffered from a mental illness has always fought. We add insult to injury when you have a brain-based disorder. Because it's not enough that you're suffering from a very real physiological wound. You now have the insult to injury, which is that we're going to marginalize you and treat you like a pariah in society. Because you act funny. You act weird. You act nuts. You act crazy. And who wants to be in that group? So the challenge here is how do we make the invisible wounds of war visible? And I believe when we do that for our soldiers, we're going to do that for all Americans who suffer from comparable brain-related disorders. But what's going to get Congress to vote for more money when they've got a million other priorities is that there's no greater priority for our nation than to be there for the veterans that were there for us. And if you look at, if you're a political science and you look at history, what has always galvanized the American public, what actually built our national highway system, was called the Cold War. That's what Eisenhower used in order to get the interstate highway system. What built the nuclear uh, program, the Manhattan Project, was national security. What ultimately enabled us to do anything we sought to do was to put it through the paradigm of national security. And frankly, it is national security. Not only because we need to save our soldiers, but we need to save all Americans who suffer from these disorders. So I'll, I'll conclude with saying that the soldiers, they fought terrorism. But you know anybody who suffers from dementia or developmental disability, or a stigmatizing disorder like depression or addiction, they're terrorized by the thought that anybody would know that they suffer from this. All right? Now, when I got a lot of press because I had addiction, believe me, they put it on the front pages of the paper. But when I went and saw a doctor for my other chronic illness called asthma, None of the press wrote about it. I wonder why. Because this illness is stigmatized. This illness is not. And ultimately, in order for us to get the science done right, we've got to address this thing called discrimination and stigma. Now, President Kennedy did something else that was pretty amazing. He was the first president to address civil rights as a president. And he said, who amongst us would trade places with someone else and be content with the counsels of patience and delay? So today people say to me, it's going to take 20, 30 years before we find out how the brain works. 
It's too long, too much time. It's too complex, too difficult. You know what Dr. King said? He said, if you walked a mile in my shoes, if you were locked up in prison because of the color of your skin like I was, you'd want to change the laws tomorrow. And the fact is, there are people in the society who are still discriminated on race, on gender, on a whole reason, litany of reasons. But they're also discriminated persistently because they suffer from a brain-based disorder. And they're marginalized. And I'm not proud to say that even while I was the, the sponsor of mental health parity, which basically said the brain was part of the body, that only was passed two years ago, by the way. The United States of America said the brain was part of the body two years ago. I know, it's funny. But if it had been another organ of the body, do you think it would have taken that long for us to pay for treatment for people with brain-based disorders? I don't think so. So we discriminate against these people. And if it was you or your loved one, you know that, that you're not willing to sit on your hands and wait 20, 30 years for an answer when we could have the answer well within our lifetime provided we have the political will. So we have the tools, we know what to do, what's the missing piece? The missing piece is political will. It's that rocket fuel that's going to blast this moonshot to the mind off and bring us all home to successfully uh, live in a world that all of us would like for our loved ones who suffer from these brain-based disorders. So that has been the animating principle behind our campaign. And I haven't found a person out there who said no. We've gotten all the NIH directors. We've had the President of the United States. He's working on something with the First Lady called um, Joining Forces for Our Veterans. We're going to be part of that in the coming year. All of the pharmaceutical industry is interested in participating with us because they know none of them can do it alone. They're better off if they work to try to do things together that none of them has to do individually and pay for individually. So if they pool their investment, everybody becomes a winner. Now, if you want to win the lottery, you can buy one ticket. Or you can buy 20 tickets. When all of you collect and go in on a pool, you increase your odds. Let's increase our odds. Let's pool and buy a lot of lottery tickets, you know, because I know how much we love gaming, right? We want to hit that Powerball. And let's invest in the thing that's going to really return, make huge returns for all of us in our lives, and that's taking care of the people we love. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. What you have just heard is one of the biggest discoveries in neuroscience, which is the Honorable Patrick Kennedy. You are a big discovery for neuroscience. Thank you so much. And so um, I'm going to run, run a short two-minute video, and then I'll answer questions. Uh, I think the video will help also answer some of those questions. Okay. Um, and I'm particularly delighted to be here on this occasion. We meet in an hour of change and challenge, in a decade of hope and fear, in an age of both knowledge and ignorance. The greater our knowledge increases, the greater our ignorance unfolds. Yeah, this country of the United States was not built by those who waited and rested. This country was conquered by those who move forward, and so will space. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Fifty years ago, John F. Kennedy posed a challenge to our country the first nation to put a man on the moon and return in the next decade. That was a heroic challenge for our country, and we came together as a nation and accomplished what people thought was impossible. We decided that we could propose a similar challenge, that we would be the first nation in the next 10 years to unlock the mysteries of the brain. Instead of going to outer space, we would go to inner space, the galaxy of neurons instead of the galaxy of stars. I think we're really starting to uncover what people have 
really hidden behind closed doors just how common these illnesses are, just how devastating they are, and how much they're told to take on society. And we basically have no choice, but we've really got to pull together, collaborate, and work together to come up with the new treatments, to come up with the new cures, to help humanity. We're at a moment of time in the effort for more funding for brain-related research. And the moment of time is not simply the burden of illness for all Americans, but most particularly for those set of Americans that can unify us along all party lines. Because when someone wears the uniform of our country, they don't say they're a Democrat or Republican, they say they're an American. So the effort to serve our veterans, saving them from being victim of the traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress that they suffered while serving us should be what unites America behind the effort for research. It's unacceptable that over 300,000 of our returning veterans have these illnesses. It's even more unacceptable that more of them are killing themselves due to depression and the effects of these disorders that are dying on the battlefield itself. What we're learning about this war is that right now it's estimated that one in three are coming home with psychological or transitional problems, traumatic brain injury, and then of course those who have been physically wounded as well. When they, when they evac me and told me I was done, it was uh, a huge loss on my part because I left my squad, my guys in Iraq, the left of them. I was an E-6 staff sergeant in the infantry. Uh, and then the Army, that's, you know, that's where the rubber meets the road. So I was a squad leader with three combat tours. And it, was, uh, it was a huge pill to swallow to start going in and seeing a mental health provider. It, I felt like, uh, like I'd failed. I think what the public doesn't understand is that as a war winds down and more come home, and in California, for example, we're expecting 30,000 a year in the next, next three or four years coming back to our state. And if you think one in three are having problems, we really are looking at a public health issue. We have great expectations we're going to be able to do something, not in 20 years, not in 10 years, but in a few years. We've got scientific tools that we never had before. Brain imaging techniques that allow us to look inside the brain with clarity that we didn't have before. We can find medicines that have transformational effects on mental illness, not just suppressing some of the symptoms, but really things that could possibly predict and prevent. So the opportunity finally to begin with imaging, with genetics, with stem cells, to get at what are the real causes of these disorders so that we could possibly begin to find real therapies that change the fate of these disorders and really have a true benefit to society. My uncle believed that uh, one person could make a difference and everybody should try. And that the spirit of his famous inaugural really elicited an aspirational desire for people to be part of something much bigger than themselves. The energy, the faith, the devotion which we bring to this endeavor will light our country and all who serve it. And the glow from that fire can truly light the world. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. So you can donate to One Mind if you want to donate. That's it for, you put it back to the slide. Congressman Kennedy will be coming down now to take a few questions, if you have any questions. Uh, yes. I, I wish I brought you here two years ago, because I would have had a very easy time convincing people of the importance of neuroscience. But thank you, I think you've oh, done a fantastic job. Thank you job. all very much. I I'll start off with, uh, with a question for you. Uh, uh, the, the question is, with all this competition you know, for funding, do you still think that neuroscience will get its you know, uh, you know, due share or equal share? Um, we're up against a lot of competition 
for becoming energy independent. So the sciences for energy independence are going to be knocking on everyone's door for more money. The sciences for, to address global warming. The sciences for everything. We cannot afford to just think that this is going to happen because everybody's going to acknowledge that we need to do it. If we go that approach, we're going to be taking the go slow approach and we're going to miss critical moments because right now the time is ticking on our ability to get to the answer. And we can't waste a moment. We need to galvanize the public in support of brain science. Yes. I've, I have the lavalier mic, so if someone wants to... Uh... <clears throat> will, one, will one mind be trying to use or pair with the technology fields to go off some of your examples? Uh, sensor systems, genome projects, uh, DNA computers, all of those hooked together. Uh, is that something that they'll be looking into? So obviously, I'm not a neuroscientist. I'm not smart enough to be a neuroscientist, OK? I want to let the people that know how to do this do their job. But I'm a, an advocate. I wrote the mental health parity law. I care about this. I've seen too many people suffer because we don't have better interventions and therapies. So I want to organize a way of getting to the answer that's faster than the way we're going now. And right now, we're duplicating effort. Pharmaceutical companies are all hoarding their science. None of them are sharing it with anybody else. The taxpayer is funding a lot of this, and we can't even get access to the science because the scientists out there are sitting on it. When it's taxpayer dollars, it's your dollars, and they're trying to get a paper in Nature magazine or Science magazine. They want to get a little award. I say bullshit. Screw your award. I want my cures. And if you're sitting on science that the taxpayer pays for, and you're not sharing it, then don't come to the federal government for any more money. We can't afford to be nice to everybody anymore. Rhode Island's in a crisis financially. What are we doing? We're joining fire systems. We're joining administrative systems. We're pairing together. How do we not have 39 cities and towns all duplicate each other? We need to do the same in neuroscience. We got to work together to get efficiencies. Now, if this were any other time, I'd say this would be too tough. But we have a perfect storm. And the perfect storm is the federal government's going to cut science budget by 20% next year. Nobody can sit back and be comfortable anymore. We got to change. And, and once everybody's uncomfortable, then they'll start moving around a little bit. Maybe they'll decide to go sit someplace else besides in their little cozy cloture of science. Maybe they'll start to think, maybe I'm stronger if I team up with other people so that we can produce something bigger that's of real value. So I'll be less concerned about coming up with my little science paper than I am launching the moonshot. When you ask anybody from NASA today how they felt being part of the program, they said they felt they were part of something bigger than them. You ask a scientist doing a scientific paper, they're out for number one. They want their paper. When are they going to start working in teams? When are they going to start saying, hey, I'm part of the global effort to find a cure for autism. I'm part of the global cure to find a, an answer for Alzheimer's. They ought to be more proud that they're part of the solution than being part of the problem. And honestly, I didn't think I could ever get this done ordinarily the way politics is. Everybody's got their little pot of money. Nobody wants to share. The crisis right now, financially, in pharma and in government, is going to make this a success because it's out of necessity that we need to start working together. First, I'd like to thank you for coming. Um, your speech has been great, um, and I really agree with your approach. However, with the economy driving symptom-based production of treatments, 
how do we how do we as a university we as a program and we as students galvanize your stance and drive that policy reform so ultimately what Dan Golden head of NASA said to me is that we needed systems analysis we do that here in Rhode Island for our submarines Raytheon does that analysis and technology we have to integrate weapon systems to talk to each other between a destroyer a submarine the Pentagon and an aircraft carrier and the plane flying overhead it's called integration systems integration we need to do that and what do we need we have all the raw material here in Rhode Island we have fantastic um, visual mechanisms like PET scans fMRIs at the VA at Brown and others you have huge resources here at URI the bottom line is and we have corporate community that already know how to do some of the elements here so no one's going to be the silver bullet no one's going to do it all but everybody's going to have a role and there isn't anyone in this room that can't be part of neuroscience it's that big so we just need to get the the program outlined because I think the money that we're going to be looking for is going to come from sovereign wealth foundations from China imagine us China outsourcing China outsourcing to Rhode Island don't you love it I mean we've been outsourcing to China our whole lives in Rhode Island this is our chance to have China outsource the cure and why does China need it because they have four grandparents two parents and one child it's part of their one child policy they've had well guess what this does this leaves them more at risk than any other country in the world for Alzheimer's they're gonna have a disaster in China in the next 10 15 years because all that wealth that China has now gone gone in 10 years try to tracking billions of people we got millions here but try billions with Alzheimer's billions with Parkinson's and that's what China's looking at right now doesn't make you feel as bad about where we sit in America anymore does it we're gonna be strong this is our way back we already lead the rest of the world in medical research and science this is where we're great let's go with where we're already strong and Rhode Island's got so much strength in this area but we need to work together because who we're gonna be competing for is not NIH anymore just alone we're gonna be competing for monies in Europe the innovative medicines initiative just changed their charter allows science to include um, US of A imagine Europe funding us I mean this is an opportunity for us to get the money coming our way when all these years we've been getting the money going their way great thank you Kyle do you think the personal accounts of people in the public eye and civilian heroes will have a severe impact on the destigmatization of mental illness overall I honestly believe that our American heroes are gonna kick down the doors of discovery and turn on the light which is gonna banish stigma in our country I wrote the mental health parity act people with mental illness are about the lowest end of the rung for popularity in Washington but who's on the top rung as they should be our veterans but what's happening to our veterans today for several months out of the year in the active duty military the biggest enemy we have as a nation is not al-qaeda it's not Taliban it's suicide suicide is claiming more of our soldiers lives than active fire and casualties so we better start to respond to this new threat because it's a threat but when we do it for our veterans they're gonna do it for everybody else and that's what's so great about our veterans there are freedom fighters and ultimately in this campaign 
They're going to set not only their colleagues free, because we're going to make these discoveries on their behalf, they're going to set all of America free when we make these discoveries and bring home these cures. Because if one of them was caught behind enemy lines, do you think it would take very long for this country to go in there and return them quickly? How long do you think it would take before the Green Berets and the Navy SEALs were kicking down those doors? And do you think any member of Congress would have the gall to ask, how much is it going to cost to conduct that military operation so that we don't leave that soldier behind? Enemy lines. Forget about it. Everybody would say, do whatever it takes. Because they were willing to do whatever it took for us. In other words, they were willing to put their very lives on the line. Now, there are a lot of people who do public service. I'm one of them. I'm in awe of our veterans because they're willing to do something that I wasn't courageous enough to do, and that's put my life in harm's way for the protection of our country. There is no greater sacrifice anybody can ask for, and commensurate with that obligation to our veterans is that we need to be there for them a fraction as much, if not all the way, that they were there for us. And I can get any Republican, any Democrat on board with this, because when I show up, I got Kit Parker, six foot eight. <laughs> and I'm telling you, that's going to change it all. We have to. And most veterans are going to be locked in our private health care system. 72% of all vets will get, will get care for TBI, PTSD, not from the VA, but from Kaiser, United, Blue Cross, Anthem. Because if we don't implement mental health parity, they're going to get denied care. And woe be the company in America that denies care for one of our American heroes. Because they're going to have to not only read about it on the front page of the USA Today, but their conscience is going to bother them because that's... But you know what? If they denied care for one of you, do you think there'd be the outcry? No, they'd say, oh, well, we can't pay for that. You know, that's just someone with mental illness. No, no, these soldiers didn't ask for these injuries. They sustain them, keeping us safe. Where is our obligation to keep our veterans safe? Bob and I know this. There's nobody who can take that on. And thankfully, because of the veterans, this is going to get done. And I was just in the Pentagon the other day, and we've got great support. We're going to line up all the military behind this. And so you want to be Walmart and say no to a dedicated fund for veterans? You want to be any company in America and say no? I don't think so. You want to be Romney or Obama and say no, I don't want to put the foot on the accelerator and say no to our veterans? Guess what? That ain't happening. And so we need to get good political science for neuroscience in order to win this, win this fight. Thank you so much. Thank you. We, we could not have had a, a better advocate for neuroscience. We could not have had a better advocate for neuroscience than Congressman Patrick Kennedy. I want you to be aware that he flew specifically to be with us this morning from Philadelphia just to spend this hour with us. He went way out of his way. All the way. Thank you. And, and thank I also you. would like to thank President Dooley and Provost DeHaze who left, who recognized the importance of neuroscience and the us to accomplish that. All the deans that have shown up here uh, indicate the importance of this neuroscience. All the faculty deck, and the students, we really appreciate your efforts. But I don't want to end without recognizing one person, which is Professor Lisa Wayan from psychology. Lisa, Lisa is the one that made this event happen. She worked very, very hard to make this happen. And without her, I don't think we would have the Honorable Patrick Kennedy here today. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you, everyone in advancement, for working on this and for helping us have a great program. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of your day.